Hi and welcome to Polly Originals with Fiona Abel Smith. So today I thought we'd do a fun little winter scene, a winter's eve in polymer clay, effectively painting with the clay by using some techniques I haven't shown you before. This is one I've done as a necklace and I've just covered it with resin. So the one I'm going to take you through today we're just going to leave as is and we'll make into a brooch. A lot of the times when I'm coming up with ideas for doing the polymer clay painting techniques I reference back to my own paintings that I've done and this is a card taken from an image of a painting I've done called The Watcher which I did a couple of years back and I think you can probably see quite clearly the reference to the colours for the background, the use of the puddles, the sheep and the trees. So this is going to be a really good fun one to do so let's start straight away and I'll take you through what equipment you need for today's project. So let's go through the equipment we need for today's project. It's nothing too technical. Most of the stuff you'll either have to hand if you're a clay worker or if you're not, you might even find stuff around the house which will do just as well. A clay roller of some description is handy. This is quite a large one. Obviously the small one will do just as well. A craft knife and a tissue blade just to cut through the clay. A blunt-ended knitting needle doesn't have to be a short one, a long one, whatever you've got. This is a four millimetre um, and something like a ball tool would come in handy. Again, you don't need this, but if you have one of those to hand, that's fantastic. So those two. You're going to need a little piece of paper, like baking parchment, wax paper, tracing paper, something like that. It's just going to put that over the clay when we press down and push the clay into itself. A little bit of liquid clay. This is um, the Fimo liquid clay. I've just decanted it into another pot because I find it easier to use. So just use one that relates to whichever brand of clay you are using. A tile to actually bake the piece on and to work on as well is handy. As is to start with some form of laminated sheet. It doesn't have to be a graph paper one, it's just these are the ones I use, so therefore I carry on using those. It can be absolutely plain, but just some form of sheet to work on rather than a tile makes it easier in one of the stages. And this is freely downloadable from www.printablepaper.net. A selection of needles. Um, I've got a blunt darning needle here, quite a sharp pointed needle and a cocktail stick, all used for making incised lines, so to get yourself a selection of those to use. If you're making a brooch like me, then obviously you'll need some form of finding a brooch back. A tiny cutter is going to come in very handy um, for what we're going to do with the sheep. If you haven't got one of these, then just cut yourself very small rounds when we get to that stage. But if you have something like that or anything, or a straw, have a look through the house. If you haven't got one of these, a straw is another alternative. Some form of texture sheet. This is a bit of um, underlay for carpets, which comes from Ikea. Um, huge big roll and it gives you a nice texture either nice square textures or if you bunch it up and press it down a nice sort of mottled texture on the back of the piece. Now for today's piece I'm going to use a template that I've cut out but I've used this basing the curves template by Melanie Muir and that's number 67 um, and what I did as you'll see when I do it later I just create my own template so if you're going to do something similar then you will need a piece of paper, some form of template sheet, scissors and a pencil. Apart from that the general tools we will be using are wet wipes um, and also obviously a pasta machine. It makes life so much easier if you've got a pasta machine. I will be doing a lot of Skinner blends so if you're not sure about how to do Skinner blends then hop on over to my video showing you how to do Skinner blends just to give you a bit of a heads up as to how to do those. For today's tutorial I'm using Fimo Soft. I'm going to be using quite a large amount of pearl, so that's one ounce. You can use white, but I just thought pearl would be nice, gives a little bit of a shimmer to the snow. We're using the lemon yellow, tangerine, lavender, royal violet and the brilliant blue. And in all of those we're using half ounce. So this was one ounce of 28 grams, half ounce 14 grams. And then just a little bit of black. This is about an eighth of an ounce or about three and a half grams. So 
So these are the colours and the blends we're going to be using for the project today. So we're going to do a Skinner blend from the Royal Violet, Lavender, Tangerine and Lemon Yellow. And all of these are half ounce or seven gram blocks. We're then going to make a light purple colour. This is with the Pearl, a little bit of the Brilliant Blue, a little bit of the Royal Violet and a little bit of the Lavender. And for these, that's these, that's quarter an ounce of the pearl, which is seven grams, and then one a thirty-second of an ounce, so a really small amount, or one gram of these colours. For the med medium purple or mid purple, we're going to use a quarter an ounce of the pearl, and then one sixteenth of an ounce, or about two grams approximately, of the brilliant blue, the royal violet, and the lavender. And then for the darker purple, no pearl at all, and we're going to use the lavender and the Royal Violet and for those two we're going to have about two grams of each so about one sixteenth of an ounce and then for the Brilliant Blue twice the amount of these two so that's about three and a half grams or about an eighth of an ounce. To make a really nice dark brown rather than use or a whole new open a whole new packet we might as well use the colours we've got going so we're using the Tangerine, the Brilliant Blue, Lavender, Royal Violet and some black, equal amounts of each. And for this, I've gone for about a 1 16th of an ounce or two grams of clay. And once we've made this brown, we can add a little bit in to this color combination, which is going to be the Skinner blend of the sheep. So that's a tiny little bit of tangerine, the lemon yellow, some pearl, and then I say some of this brown. And the amounts, we've got about a 1 32nd again, or about one gram of the tangerine and the brown, and then about one sixteenth, or about two grams of the yellow and the pearl. So those are all the amounts and the colours we're going to use. So let's start, and we're going to begin by making the Skinner blend. So I've thoroughly conditioned my clay and just rolled them into very sort of squat little shapes. The two on the end, which I'm going to put together, the lemon yellow and the royal violet, I've made into slightly triangular shapes and these two just sort of long lozenge shapes so that when we put them together, we can effectively get the shape that we would normally be doing our Skinner blend in. So one colour on one side, one on the other, and then a nice diagonal cross through. So we'll end up with all yellow, mixing into the orange, mixing into the lavender, and then mixing through to the violet. So we'll just give it a little bit of a roll to start with. And then I'll put it through the pasta machine. So I'm going to put it through the pasta machine that way down on setting number two. And I'm going to keep this quite nice and short. So as you can see, I'm already pushing this up, just making it slightly shorter. So through that way on setting number two on my machine where naught is the thickest and nine is the thinnest. So now it's come out through once. I'm just going to fold it up with the sides meeting up. As you can see, when, as we put it together, so we're going to get a nice mix where all the colours are going to overlap each other slightly. So I'm going to keep putting it through on setting number two on the pasta machine. Each time I put it through, I'm going to abut it hard so if that's the side of the pasta machine, I butt it hard up against the pasta machine and keep it nice and short. I certainly don't want it going any longer than this. If I can get it shorter, even better. Those of you who've got things that you put in the pasta machine, um, little magnets people use or bits of metal, they would work perfectly. If you want a pack of polymer clay, get yourself an unopened pack and put that in your pasta machine. Just sit it on the rollers and then this will stop this getting any wider. What we're really looking for is to have a piece about this wide when we're finished. So I'll start putting it through and each time I put it through I'll just fold it top to bottom again. So I will bring you back when we have a nice blend of that done and complete. So there we have a nice blend for our sky. Now I'm not going to need very much of that at all. So I'm just going to take a bit of that off for what we're doing today and that bit we're going to put on one side to do for another project but it's always easier to do slightly more in a Skinner blend than you think you're going to need because it gives you the little bit that's left over which is brilliant. 
Having finished with your piece, you then need to decide what thickness you're going to work on. Now, because I'm doing a piece that's going to become a brooch, I am going to put some backing scrap clay behind this. So because of that, I don't need it particularly thick. So I'm going to do this on setting number three, which means that all the pieces I then do will also end up on setting number three when I start to put them all together. But choose at this stage what thickness you want to do, and then just make sure that all your pieces are the same thickness. So I'll put this through on setting number three, and I'm also going to work on actually pushing it so when put it back through the pasta machine that way to give myself a longer thinner piece but I'm going to work on concentrating on it just a fraction shorter so I only want it really to be about that wide so I'm going to push that in by using other bits in the pasta machine until I get it to a nice width I want it at. Okay so there we have a piece, little marks on that side but when you turn it over that side's pristine so that's the side I'm going to use um, for what we're starting to do. So find your template that you're planning on using and then get yourself make sure your piece you're going to cut is big enough to fit that for the brooch we're using today i want to make a nice round oval shape and i'm using the curves template by melanie muir and that's number 67 and what i'm doing is i'm actually going to go slightly bigger than this so if you get yourself a sheet of paper fold it in half Put your template down so that it is about as equal to the half as you can get it and draw around it. You can then either by hand draw around or when you cut it's easier to get a nice smooth cut around and go slightly bigger. So the pair of scissors, I'm actually going to go just in between those two I think so probably about there. When you open that out, you've got both the positive and the negative, so we'll use those when we're working out things to do with our pattern later on and the sizes that we're working for. So having got our piece ready, we can go to that template, and this time I'm going to use the, the positive bit just to mark out roughly, so all I, all I need is a bit that's going to be wider, and that will be the start of our background colour, and this spare bit we'll use later on as well. So the next bit we're going to do, we're going to use our light purple and our dark purple. And both of these we're going to put through on setting number three on the pasta machine. So the same setting that I've been using, so if you're using a different setting, then you would put that through on a different setting. And with our piece that we know we're going to use for the sky, we're going to, with a cocktail stick, or some of the pointy tool you've got a needle be just as good we're going to mark ourselves out roughly where we want the trees to be so I'm going to come down here because I want it to go quite light so this is going to be the a mark where we're having no trees and then we're looking at the top line of the trees so the top line of the trees will sort of come up like that on that side do it slightly lower on this side about like that so when you've marked in where your top line is going to be then you can take a craft knife and cut down don't worry too much about making any mess at this stage because we're going to be doing quite a bit of cutting for other things in between this you're then going to take your piece and lay it on top of the light purple colour and then repeat the pattern you've been working on Take a tissue blade, chop down there, and then you should hopefully be able to pick that piece out, and that pit will slot back in quite nicely. So that's the, uh, the tops of your trees, and now we'd have the bottom of the trees. So as I said, this spot I want to be sort of like a vanishing point in the distance, there's going to be no trees there. So for me, my trees will come down here, coming towards the foreground and down here on this side. So again, just cut that piece out with your craft knife. Put this bit back on one side because we'll be using that again later on. 
So I've now just swapped over to um, a measuring sheet because what I want to do, I want to add a little bit of darkness that comes in at the bottom of these trees. So I'm just going to take quite small at the far way and come slightly bigger this way. The same again. Going down to into a thin triangle. I just put those two pieces onto there and then cut out the same pieces. This is very much a case of just thinking where you want to put your pieces, cutting them out and matching them. But at this stage you don't have to be precise at all. So don't worry about anything like that because we're about to do lots of changes to this and sort of mix all the colours up a bit. And as you can see there, I've kept, still kept this gap in the middle where those trees are going to be going away. And now we have a bit of a fun bit because what you're going to do is with the tip of your cocktail stick or a little needle or anything else you've got, we want to really mix up these two colours. And we're going to mix them up because this creates the, the highlights and the shadow bits in the background of the trees. So to do that, whilst it's sitting nice and firm on your measuring sheet, just flick up and create a lot of texture in that bottom bit of purple. And can you see how when you flick it up, I'm actually pulling pieces off, pieces are becoming detached. And when they become detached, let them ride up and stick to and flick on into a bit at the top. You can do the reverse, take some of the light bits and let those go into the bottom. So you're just really mixing up the whole piece here, creating a way, sort of one sort of jumbly effect. Any bits that flick off, just put them back on. And you say you're just looking, don't worry about this bottom line because we're going to tidy that up later. You're just looking for a nice effect. And when you've sort of done a bit of it, get a little bit of your um, wax paper or baking sheet and then just start pressing that down. So smooth down just to see what you've got. And you should hopefully start to get a nice random sort of pattern. So it's starting to come, starting to look like the bottom of the trees. And we can do exactly the same on the other side. When you've done a bit, then press down to see what you've got. And then we're going to do the same at the top, not so much at the top, just a little bit, because we're actually going to take a little bit of that edge make it as if the tops of the trees are nice and sort of fine with all sorts of different shapes. A little bit of the orange colour goes down, that's fine. So a little sort of like almost swirly round movements I'm doing just to create a more of a ragged top to those trees. And if the orange comes down, it just looks so uh, those bits where you can see the sky through the tops of the trees. Try and keep the orange bits more towards the top of the trees rather than pushing them down towards the middle. And then we'll press down there, see what we've got. So you can see it's starting to create a nice sort of tree-like top. Do the same on this side. So I quite like that, it's quite a nice sort of um, mix of bits around here. I'm just going to work a little bit more on the area around here and this one around here, just take them back a bit. So I'll spend a bit of time working on that, just doing exactly the same and I'll bring you back when I'm done. Okay, so I spent a bit more time just Make it slightly more even as far as I was going to said, and then I was going to come back in and make that a slightly narrower cut off, cut off the excess of the deep purple. And 
And then we've got our nice trees with a shadow at the bottom ready to put our snow bit in the front. So the snow is going to be another Skinner blend. So we'll leave that for now and we'll do the Skinner blend bit next. So for our Skinner blend, I've still got all of these on setting number three. I've gone mainly all pearl. So you can see there it's gone right across probably two thirds of it. It's going to be the pearl. Then a little stripe of the light purple and then a small triangle at this end of the medium sized purple. So there's no dark purple in this one at all because I want there to be a difference between the darkest bit of this and the bottom of that tree line. So I'm just going to take those pieces and fold them up like that. So I'm going to have all pearl on this side and then going darker. And I'm going to put that through the pasta machine going down that way. And as before, try and keep it nice and thin. So certainly no um, wider than this, if anything, slightly less wide. So each time I put it through, I'm going to press it in like that to give myself a nice Skinner blend. And I will bring you back when I've done that. So here's our Skinner blend finished. And there's our piece we were working on earlier. So I'm just going to pull this up off and lay him down. And you can see there, you can see the difference between the bottom of the trees and the start of the snow line. And I'm just going to work out, make sure I've got enough there to do my shape, which I have. So it'll be something like that when I cut it out. So as long as I'm happy, I might move up just a fraction. Cool, slightly more down the bottom. Okay, that's fine. And again, when I've done that with some form of marking tool. I'm just going to mark off where to go. Fit him back in there. And then just as we did before, just very, very lightly, I'm just going to squidge slightly that joining line so it's more natural than just a flat line where those two bits have joined because some of the trees at the bottom will, won't meet the snow, won't, won't meet in exactly a straight line so you just want to jiggle with it just a little bit and then we'll smooth it over and we'll smooth that over better in a moment or two but that's giving us a, a good start so we can see where we're going with the line you want a nice bit of sky so you can put the tree detail in but also enough of the foreground so we can put the puddle in put some sheep and get all the detail in the foreground as well so the next thing we need to do is we're going to put a puddle in but in order to do a puddle we need to have a slight shadow where the puddle is going to hit so you need a tiny tiny bit of a skinner blend So to do our Skinner blend, that's going to be the edge of the puddle, we're going to take a little bit of the pearl, a little bit of the medium purple, and a tiny, tiny bit of the dark purple. And if you then roll them, because these colours are already nice and soft, because we've been working with them, roll it so it's flatter, and then diagonally fold it over as if we were doing a Skinner blend. So can you see there where I've actually overlaid and overlapped those colours slightly. And again, on setting number two, Put it through the pasta machine, but try and keep it nice and thin if you can. So I'll bring you back when that's done. So there we go. Teeny tiny little Skinner blend. That's all we need. I'm going to chop that in half. Put the two bits together. Just pressing down so they join. And I'm going to put it back through the pasta machine on the same setting. So setting number two in that direction to give me a longer sheet. And then I want a really nice long thin sheet. So go down either one setting at a time all the way down to your thinnest setting or if you know you can go down to your thinnest usable setting go straight down to that one and we're going to get ourselves a nice long thin sheet of this blend okay there we go so what we're going to do now is we're going to concertina it but we're going to concertina it really quite small can you see that it's probably only about a quarter of an inch about three quarters of a centimeter as i'm going backwards and forwards just concertinaing it because what we're looking to get is a really small Skinner blend. A thin piece that we can use to line the edge of our pond or our puddle. It makes such a difference. So having got it together like that, simply press it even thinner with your fingers. So can you see I've done it really quite thin there. So 
however you, wide you want the, um, the bottom of your pond outline to be, that's how thin you need to press it. So I'm just going to take a slice off, so you can see what it looks like. I know I need to go thinner than that still. So I'm going really quite thin. Now I'm going to take another slice off. And now I'm going to put that through the pasta machine that way down on setting number three, because of course that's the setting um, we're working for. And then you can start taking thin slices and that will be the edge of your pond. Okay, so there it is on setting number three. So I'm going to do a couple of those slices because I might need more than one. And now let's start putting the pond in. So the thing to do is to go back to your picture and to decide where you want your pond to be. Now I'm going to turn it the other way up just for a second so I can draw this in the right way up. And when you're drawing, you want to make sure that most of your lines are running horizontally across the piece. Because even a puddle, when you're looking at it in this foreshortened way, will look as though most of the lines are horizontal. So you can see here, and here, and here, and here, it's got a very horizontal look to it. And where I've come forward, I've done so in little sort of increments, little swirls. So having done that, with your craft knife, as roughly as you can, follow the line of what you've done. Yank that piece out. To find a piece from your blend, turn it the other way up, put it as if where the yellow was so the bottom of my yellow was actually about there before I chopped it off. And then with your piece like that, bring it over to here. And then you can see where to chop round to give yourself a piece that will fit into the bit you've cut out. And don't fit it in as yet but just have a look to see whether or not that looks right. If it's got the right amount of reflection for where it would be. If not, then obviously just cut yourself a different piece. But now we can have fun and start putting in the shadows on the tops of the bank of the pond. So taking the slice we put through the pasta machine a short while ago, have a look at how thick your setting is. And that's the thickness of the piece we need to chop. So for me, it's going to be about there. You might well need to chop more than one piece and this shadow is going to be on the top side of your pond. So just put it up and before you put it in very carefully just add your shadow on. You can join the pieces if you need to and it's going to go all the way around just on that top edge of your pond because you're not going to see this is where the snow dips down where it's built up against the bank of your pond. Okay and now of course we've added an extra bit all the way around the top of this so we need to take an extra bit of this out otherwise our piece won't fit. So very carefully just cut yourself a little extra piece all the way around the top here. You can look and see actually that's, I know that's going to uh, fit in. It quite often happens that it just rounds the ends off when you're working. And with any luck you should be able to pick this up and more or less fit it in to your piece. So take a bit of time. There's no rush to this one. You can usually manoeuvre the clay, but try and keep this top bit where you've got that shadow on the pond nice and pristine because it gives much more of a three-dimensional effect if you've got that in place. With a clean finger, you can actually push 
snow up at the bottom to fit in. But that just makes your pond look much more three-dimensional as if it's got an edge along the top. So we're now at the stage. We can have a look and see what we've got. Decide where we want this piece to go. If we want to go bigger, you might want to go bigger. So you've got uh, choices you can make. But we're at a stage now where, because I'm going to be doing this as a brooch, I'm going to want to put this onto some form of backing. So I'm going to pick the whole thing up and with a very thin layer of scrap clay underneath, probably setting number seven of scrap clay, I'm just going to lay the whole thing on scrap clay and then I'm going to start burnishing it until I get a really nice smooth finish to this. So I'm just going to take it off for now and say get some scrap clay and put a layer of scrap clay underneath. Having put the backing clay on, I've cut it down neatly to a size that's convenient to work with and I've put it onto the tile that I'm going to bake on. Because from this point on, we're going to be pressing down into it so I want to make sure it's nicely pressed onto the tile. I take a little bit of the paper, just to press it down, make sure there's no bubbles or anything else underneath. And now I need to have a look and see roughly where I'm going to be cutting my piece from so I know where to position the trees. So I'm going to have a look around, find a piece that I think looks nice. I'll probably go somewhere like that. And I'm going to put that piece in place. And then just draw a little line just wider than that. Just so I've got a rough idea where I'm going to be putting things. So I know the area I'm working in. There's no point doing lots of work in an area you're not going to be in. Because having done that, we can start putting our trees in. So when I'm doing the trees, we're actually going to inscribe into the unbaked clay. So I'm going to start with um, a large darning needle because it's got quite a soft rounded end and it's not going to dig in too much but it's going to give us a nice groove. So I do want to have the trees where I'm going to have a little bit of a reflection in the water. So I'm going to start one here, so on the river bank, but not actually touching going down into the pond. And I'm just going to squiggle across. So I'm creating a groove in the background clay. Then I'll have another tree. Should we probably put him about here? Same sort of thing, squiggling backwards and forwards. Let's take him over there. And then you can start putting some more branches on your trees. It's good to have them going out of the picture. And it's also good at times to have trees going down across themselves. I'm going to put the sheep down here so I can have more coming out here. Having a shaky hand is better for this than not. And don't worry too much about the little bits of grooves where it's standing proud next to it. We'll sort those out in a minute or two. The other thing I'd spend a little bit of time on is making sure that where all these pieces go down into the trunks, the trunks are big enough to accommodate and look the right size for the amount of branches coming off them. So where you've got two branches or two of these joining, you'd actually have enough to take the two pieces. It's the same here. We've actually got this bit's already going to go slightly bigger for here. So it needs to be bigger coming down here. This bit needs to be bigger at the bottom than it is at the top. And then because I've got those extra bits on, I need to make the bottom bigger as well. So this middle bit I'm just pushing down in. As long as it's enough of a groove to stick our clay in later, that's all we need. And where the trees join down towards the snow, they'll go out slightly. They won't go right down to the bottom because there'll be snow piled up against in here. Same thing here. But I'm going to keep it nice and smooth along that edge because it's not going to go into the pond, just below the pond. So having got those bits on, then with a finer needle, so it's got a much finer point, I can then start to go back and add on more detail. Take your time, there's no rush in this. You can put as many or as few trees in as you like. 
And just when I'm doing trees, I'm always thinking where they join, there's going to be little sort of Y shapes. And as the branches go outwards, they naturally get thinner and smaller. And just keep going, adding pieces on until you get a good look. The bits right at the top can be really quite fine and spiky. And I'm just going around adding bits on. It's nice to have all the branches intersecting. Gives more realism that way. It's also nice just to have a couple of little branches little spiky bits down near the bottom as well and you can also have just some little bits of grass coming up little bits of twigs that sort of thing that come up near the trees so have a look make sure you're happy and then we can start putting some sheep in when you're thinking about putting your sheep in you want to have something that's going to be roughly the right size so I've gone from one of these little tiny cutters which you can buy um, online in stores and I've just given myself tiniest little impression down here just to see how it looks in relation to the trees and everything else I reckon that's going to be about the right size so then we're going to make our Skinner blend and we're going to do that using this color combination we had when we were going through all the colors that we were working with today so I will just do that next so as before take your colors and if they are all nicely conditioned so nice and soft I'm just rolling them flat. We'll put them through the pasta machine on setting number two. And then as before, we're just going to skew them slightly so that we've got all the overlapping bits on those. So the first time, skew them, and then every time after that, just fold top to bottom so that all the sides meet. Always put through, fold first, and I'll bring you back when I've got a nice little blend of this one. So there's our blend. Don't worry too much about the orange and the brown being so um, such big broad bands. We only need a little bit of those. But it's easier to do it again this way and then take our um, cutting bits once we're done. Um, as before, we're going to put it through, back through the pasta machine on the same settings, the setting number two. I'm going to put it through that way to give myself a longer strip. And then again, as we did with the um, previous small Skinner blend, we're going to put it down onto a very thin setting. So either go one down at a time on settings on your pasta machine or straight down to the thinnest, whichever you know is um, works best with the pasta machine you have. So there's our longer strip. And again, exactly as we did when we were doing the um, shadow for the pond, we're just going to put this together in a very small concertina. Again, about a quarter of an inch three quarters of a centimetre wide don't need to press it quite so small this time because what we want is a piece that's going to be big enough that we take a middle bit get a tiny bit of the orange tiny bit of the brown so I'm going to press it a little bit smaller and then just take a piece and experiment so I'm going to take a, cut a slice off have a look where I'm going that's probably not far off what I want so I can then take a thinnish slice put that through the pasta machine on setting number three as we've been doing before to give myself a nice long strip just to see what we've got so that'll be fine and then because we're laying this on top I'm actually going to make this thinner so I'm going to put it through on setting number five on my machine so now for our three sheep I can take a cutting it's got a little bit of the brown a little bit of the orange because the orange just looks like the highlight of the sunset hitting the top of the sheep there we go so those are three little shapes we'll get our piece back and just put one on just for size just to see how it looks because if it doesn't look the right size you can always redo it I think I'm happy with that size so thinking about where I'm going to put them and I'll change the size of them in just a minute if I have one two three I might have all three of them reflected in the water so I need to cut myself another three for the reflect reflected sheep and now I need to think about the shape of my sheep 
So the one I'm going to put here is going to be facing towards me. So he is actually going to be fairly round. And I will put him there. Because he's close to the water edge, he will also his reflection will be fairly round. However, because we've got the bit of the bank in between, you won't see all of him. So we're going to chop off the bottom bit. And put the bit you would see opposite where he's standing. I'll have another round one. So again, one facing towards me. Actually, we'll do him probably about there. And then we'll have a long uh, one facing sideways. So one facing sideways, I'm actually just going to squash the shape slightly. And he'll be next to him about there. He can be right down on the bank again. So because he's on the bank, you will see a reflection. So squash another one. But as before, you won't see all of it. So pull him out and put him below where you would see the reflection of him. And then this one, you'd only really see the very top of his head because there's quite a bit of a gap between him and the reflection. So probably, really, and then of course we've also got a bit of the pond there where it's going. So you'd, he's going to be here, but you've got a bit of the, um, the pond that's going off to the side, so we need to take a bit of that off as well. You'd only see a tiny bit of him. Just about like that. So have a think about where your reflections go. Also at this stage, you can have a think about where the reflections of the trees go. And one of the things about with the trees, it's doing reflections the same as when you're painting. It's actually quite hard to do it from here and then to think. It's much easier if you turn it sideways and mirror what you've got. So he's going down here. I should do it with the same needle I use. So he's going down here and then he was going up here. And obviously it's only going to reflect in the water. So you've got bits here and there's a bit that's going up there. But most of this was going this way. And then there's a bit going up there. And then for this one, not really very much you can see of this one at all. It's really sort of just this end bit here. A little bit of water the other side. So there we go. So that's the reflections of the trees. And now we need to do the sheep. So the sheep themselves, although we've got a bit of shading in here, we really want to um, pick up that feeling of um, their coats and the, the change of all the patterns. So again, with a cocktail stick, just as you did with the back of the trees, we're just going to mix up those colours ever so slightly and push them slightly back into the background clay. Just gives them a bit of texture, means you can have a bit of a play around with the shapes. Make them slightly more sheep shaped. Same with the reflected ones, making sure not to hit that nice purple line of the shadow of the pond. Do the same with this one over here. And the same thing. Do his shadow. And the head of the sheep. We're not going to do anything too... Um, we're basically going to make a, a dent that sort of shape and the ears are just that going to either side so that's be your, your onward facing one slightly more domed over the top but basically like that so that'll be for that one and that one and this one I'm going to try and decide where I want the head to go but a, a sidewards facing one is going to be more sort of that shaped depending which way they were going sort of see the ear going out that way that's all we're going to do and what we're going to do for the sheep's head is just create a groove 
in our pattern where they would be. Now I'm going to use the blunt end of the knitting needle for this and I'm going to do it so it goes just here so it's going to go down onto its body and then slightly above and then I'm turning the needle on its side just to create the grooves for the ears. And then the same with this one. So the head's going down across where the body would be. Up above slightly. Groove for the ear. Groove for the ear. And of course you've got to do the same on the reflection. There's the head. Groove for the ear. Groove for the ear. Same on this one. Head going round. Ear, ear. And then this one. I'm going to have his his face actually going across this other one so it looks as though they're actually standing one in front of the other. So that's a bit with the head and there's the ears. So it's going to be the same on the reflection. And the last but not least thing you need to do is think about where their feet are going to go or their legs. So I'm just going to draw one, two little grooves and a couple of tiny little ones above that to make sure you've got all the grooves where the legs are. So if I hold that up so you can see it more clearly, see where all the grooves are. And I've just spent a little bit of time just going back over the um, bodies of the sheep, just making sure the um, texture's quite good. And of course you don't have to put the sheep in at all. You can leave the sheep out if you want to. But the last thing to do before we bake it is to think if you want to have any sort of footprints or anything going down at the front of the piece. I've just literally turned it around towards me for this bit, just need to make sure I can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to have, because my stream's going that way to me, I'm going to have some footprints. Coming out. So all I've done is I've put little dots there, getting bigger towards the forefront and decreasing as they go back and I've just done them with my knitting needle because we can then take the piece we used to do the, um, the bit around the edge of the pond and if you've got any bits left from where you did your slices previously so that was a little bit that we'd done which we'd got left over when we put it down to the nice thin bit this is a bit fiddly, so if you don't want to do this bit, obviously just don't. I'm going to do it so that the white is uppermost. And I'm going to chop this into tiny little pieces. So I'm chopping down between the two to start with. And then I'm just going to... Chop tiny little bits. Some bigger than others. So if you can see that, the tiny bits I've chopped, because you should then be able to take the little bits up on your finger. And if you can press them in to where you've created the holes so that the purple is on the bottom, and that's all we're doing at the moment, just putting them into those little holes so that the purple is on the bottom. And then with a blunt-ended knitting needle, I'm just going to sort of swoosh, smush, sort of push them in and make them slightly blurred. And more of a shape, sort of like shadows, where there's been little footprints going in. They can be as big or small as you want, but they should sort of be decreasing in size as they go away. And there you have your footprints. So I've just had a really good look at mine, made sure it's exactly as I want it. I've decided I do want to cut just slightly bigger than I was planning on going. So I'm just going to take my craft knife and go around the outside trying to keep a nice smooth shape as I go. So 
great thing about polymer clay, of course, is you can change your mind at any point. I'll pull the excess away and we'll see what we've got. And I might sort of mess about with the shape a little bit more before I bake it because it's not quite symmetrical, so I'll have a bit of a mess around. But then when I'm happy, I will bake it and I'll bring you back once it's baked. Once your piece comes out of the oven, if you can, leave it on your tile so it sort of sticks while we do the next bit. Mine might well ping off pretty quickly because I gave it quite a bit of a move round before I put it in to bake. Then take your brown clay, the one we mixed up earlier, and just rub it around in your hands quite a bit until it becomes nice and soft and slightly warm. And then put it through a thinnish setting of the pass machine. Really doesn't matter what sort of setting, just a thinnish setting. So I'm going to put mine through on probably number six. And this gives you a nice sheet of clay. Then we're just going to lay this right over where our trees are. I'm avoiding the sheep heads but just putting it in where all those oh, you see mine's come off already where all the bits are where the um, tree's gone so I might as well take him off there it's easier for you if it's actually sticking to something um, then take something like a ball tool and we're just going to roll down and we're going to push this brown clay into all those scratch marks that we made earlier before we baked if you haven't got a ball tool then doing it with the edge of a knitting needle works or any other similar tool and you can see there it's starting to really go down into the um, scratches and just keep working like this keep pushing the clay down once you think you're nearly there then you can take something like the knitting needle and just start to scratch the clay off and you'll see there's areas that you've missed. So I've already seen, for instance, this trunk and down here. So just take little bits and push it back down in. All we're looking to do is to get this clay level with the surface we've got elsewhere. And of course we've got the bit in here where the trunk went into the reflection as well. So add that bit in there. So now you can take yourself a nice clean wet wipe and giving yourself a smooth area just start to take away all the excess and if you hold it flat across your finger you won't be pulling out what you've placed into your marks you'll only be removing the excess dark clay I say have, have a good look, make sure you've got all the bits off and it's all nice and clean because of course any bits you leave on at this stage we're going to rebake it will become hard again. So now I want to make a little bit of colour, just a tiny bit to go in with the sheep's heads. So I'm going to take a little bit of this brown clay and then a tiny little bit of the black because you don't want the sheep's head to be too dark if you put com just completely black in you'll find it just looks too dark for the um, the rest of the color scheme but just by adding a little bit of black into a small bit of brown and mixing that in thoroughly that should give us enough difference and you see how small amount there um, that should give us enough difference to be able to make a darker color to use for the sheep head and then just as before that is already nice and soft I'm going to take tiny tiny amounts and just push it into those grooves that we created for the sheep heads. And then little bits underneath them, just where their feet are. Okay, so I've just spent a bit of time with my needle and a little bit of um, wet wipe sort of going into where the sheep's bodies are to make sure um, I haven't got any dark clay on that. And then the final bit, we're going to add a little bit of highlight 
onto these trees. So in exactly the same way as we did before, before this bakes, with a nice thin needle, you can go back and dig down into your brown clay. And of course, wherever you push your needle down, that will leave a groove, which we can then add some white into when this is baked. So I'm just going along. Top ones here, you can go along most of those. Add little grooves. If you're thinking, if your trees are big enough that you can think exactly where the snow would fall, then obviously it would fall on the top of the branches. Collect where there's any grooves. So aim towards to go to the, if you've got a large enough branch, always go towards the top of the branch to make it more, look more realistic. But on these smaller ones, just any groove will do. And take a bit of time and just go and add all your lines in. Put lines in for the snow. When it comes down to the trunks, at the bottom, you can add a bit more detail in, some more lines and going up the side of the tree, wherever the snow would probably have lain, but still you need to leave some of the, the trunk showing. And of course, don't forget, whatever you do at the top here, you need to then do a reflection of and do the same underneath. And when you've done all of that, put it back on your tile and bake again according to the manufacturer's instructions for the brand of clay you're using. So again, I'll do mine for about half an hour. And I'll bring you back when that's done and we put all the excess white in. Once our piece has come out and it's been fully baked, exactly the same as we did with the brown clay, I've got some of the pearl clay which I've kept nicely warmed and then we're just going to lay that over and same as we did before with either a roller, a ball tool or a knitting needle or some form of tool, we're just going to push some of the pearl clay into all the extra grooves we created for the snow. Once you're done, take off as much of the excess as you can and then just as we did before, a nice clean wet wipe, nice and flat over your finger and then just rub off all the excess to leave the highlighted snow over the branches of the trees. So I just spent a bit of time with a thin point of a needle just taking out any excess bits that were around the sheep which have got stuck and then once you're happy you've got all your pieces out then bake again. I'll bring you back as we put the final backing on it and make this one into a brooch. So when your piece has finished baking, so this one's all come out and is done, you just need to decide what it is you want to do and what you're going to make it into. I'm going to make this one into a brooch this time. Um, so I've taken the remainder of my royal violet and the brilliant blue clay that I've got left and all the other mixes of purples and put them all together to create a sheet big enough to fit around and to give me excess around the outside because we're going to pull this up around the sides. I put this through on quite a thin setting because I don't want to have too much showing around the side but it's still enough that it's going to hold my brooch back in place. So setting number four is what I've put this one through. I'm now going to put just a very, very thin layer of liquid clay on the back and also round the sides. Now if you've watched before you know what I'm about to say. Not enough to make it slippy, just enough to make it tacky or sticky. You don't want your clay to slide off, you want it to actually stick to this. So if you've got too much you can just take the excess off with your fingers. When you're happy, place it down on your sheet. And I'm going to lift this up and from the back I'm going to pull away towards the outside to make sure I've got no air bubbles trapped on the underneath at all. And I'm just going to start folding that very gently 
up round the sides, trying not to distort the amount of clay I've got going on. Put it to the top side. So I'm just pulling the clay up and around. And those of you who've seen the video I did with the landscape brooch with the painting technique, you'll know that as far as I'm concerned, I always consider this Donna's technique, as in Donna Cato. Um, I know lots of other people have done this, and it's on the, the internet, and it's widely available. I've got no idea who first did the technique, but I first saw it at Donna Cato, so as far as I'm concerned, it's Donna Cato's technique. And then with the tissue blade, I'm just going to run that all the way along the edge, parallel with the underneath baked clay, so that it just takes it off and gives us a nice smooth finish on the top. Well, I'm only doing it roughly at the moment. There we go, take the excess off. I'm not going to bother too much with the finessing it because what I want to do now is to put the brooch back on. So I'm going to turn it over. And I'm going to put the brooch back in a place where I think it will hang nicely. Make sure it's running parallel with how the brooch is going to sit. And then with a craft knife, I just do the two lines there. So to the point at which it stops being square. I'm going to extend it slightly this end. But then I'm going to take this into a little triangle point because that's how the brooch is shaped but it's also will remind me to put the brooch back in the right way around so I'm going to take off the excess from that end there take a little bit off here you should then be able to sit your brooch in we've already remember got a bit of liquid clay on the back in there that should then sit back in and resting it gently on my hand so I'm not putting any pressure on the underneath I'm going to use my knitting needle to just slowly move backwards and forwards where those joins are to make sure that brooch back is set very nice and neatly into the back. And I just use the needle to push right up to get into this bit here. You'll notice I've made sure I've pulled this bit clear Roll the needle over again. Same with this bit. Move it backwards and forwards. And then I will always, sort of pushing that down, before I bake it, make sure that I've pushed that nicely down to create a little groove where the bit of metal sits in so that you're not going to, be able to give too much pressure once your piece is baked. I don't bake with it um, closed, bake with it open. So again, you're not going to put pressure on this layer of clay we've got here. And then if you wanted to act, add texture, I've just taken a bit of, um, it's actually underlay, carpet underlay, the stuff that stops the carpet moving. So it's got a nice grid pattern on it. If you squidge it up, you can actually get a nice random pattern. Once the back's finished, I'm going to very gently turn over and pay slightly more attention to the front. Make sure all the clay is stuck nicely around the outside and now I can go back and really start to finesse and take off all the excess clay where it runs up next to our piece. So there's our piece ready to bake and I would bake him upside down so that I can leave this with this piece standing open when I bake him. So that's it, and I'll bring you back when he's baked to show you the final piece. So there we are, there's our piece finished and baked from the oven. And just to show you a comparison, here's the one I did beforehand. And this one I've added a resin surface to. As you can see it's all nice and shiny. And this one I just put a a little groove sort of on the back, a little place to do as a pendant, so that one can be independent. The other thing to note is this one I did with white clay rather than pearl, and 
the pearl does sort of go back into the background just a, a fraction. I think there's a slight translucency to it. So if I was doing the um, the whites in the trees again, then it's actually better to do it perhaps with a mixture of the white and pearl, and possibly even do that for the Skinner blend here, just a mixture of the white and pearl. There's also a couple of different options for you here. This one's very much a monochrome, all done in greens. Again, done with the pearl clay, and this one is done more sort of in, I suppose, sort of natural colours in as much as the normal yellow to red to blue um, sunset, green trees, and then the reflections in the pools. The reflections in the pools, for me, I think are working better where you've got a completely different colour here. Although you've got the pools in here, it's much more subtle um, because the sky is the same colour. So again, bear that in mind when you're having a play around. I haven't done anything with these at the moment by way of putting any backgrounds on them because I haven't decided what I'm going to do with them. They may be brooches, or I might do fridge magnets, um, card toppers, put them on little sort of plaques, make them into pictures. I haven't decided yet, so I'll come back to that. I know you can also go larger still if you want. So this is what I'm going to do probably for something like a journal cover, or again possibly just have it as a, a little painting. Exactly the same thing, but just done in bigger form with more puddles as we've gone through. So again, add as many as you want to do. I've got more trees in this one. You can have as much fun with this technique as you want. So I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. Again, it's another one to do just to show you how you can do a little bit of um, sort of faux painting in polymer clay. So it's given you a few new techniques that we haven't done before. The use of the cocktail stick to get these trees in the background, just sort of flicking the bits out to give you all the random things. Obviously the cutting out and filling in with the ponds and doing the little um, edging. And then things like the footprints. And you can see on these, I've also just added little bits of grass in. That literally just flicks with the, um, the needle as you're doing the rest of it and then putting those in. And then with the trees, just showing you how you can draw with, into the um, unbaked clay with things like needles to create the spaces which you can then backfill and how to do the double backfill um, to get the snow on the top. So, as I say, I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. If you did, don't forget to um, tick like and or subscribe because I always appreciate it when people subscribe. It makes such a difference. Thank you. And don't forget to have a look at the website if there's anything you want to see on there, see more of my work. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.